a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved of Phoebe, Archippus, and our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from the Lord, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ and toward the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolidation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. Being such a, a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I, I appeal to you for my son, Juan Simus, whom I have begotten while well in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but is now profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If, you, if then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. If Ephraim, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Artistarchus, Damas, Luke, and my fellow laborers, to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Awesome work. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone's got a Bible? If you don't have one, there's one in the pew under, in front of you. Um, last week and this week, the praise team has sang songs that kind of go right along with my message, just like the, uh, the great thou art and uh, give God the glory because that's what we're here for, right? To give him the glory, to give him the praise, to give him the honor. And so, as I was thinking this week, I, <coughs> I looked up, uh, I had a, a little um, note that I had wrote down just before Billy Graham died. And he had called a bunch of his friends together just before he died. And one of them asked him, what's going to happen now? Who's going to be the next Billy Graham? And his reply was, and I thought this was really interesting, God is tired of people getting the glory. So he said, God is going to start using people that you would never expect to use to get glory. And this week I was reading an article about Anthony Oliver. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. He's the one that sings Richmond, North of Richmond or whatever. Um, he was saying that he was getting pains. One day it'd be in his neck, next day it'd be in his arm, next day it'd be in his leg, and then the next day it'd be back in his neck. And he was beginning to wonder what was happening. So he went to the emergency room, and the doctor looked him over and said, it's not your heart. He said, but there is something killing you. And so he said he went out to the parking lot, he got in his pickup truck, and he put his head over the steering wheel and he began to cry. Because he realized that for the last 30 years, well, the last few years of that 30 years, he'd been doing marijuana and drinking heavily. And so he now realized that that was killing him. That was going to eventually put him in a grave. 
And so he simply said, and I was shocked, he said, I just told God I'm powerless. I can't do anything on my own. If you don't do something, I'm going to die. And he didn't want to die. So he said to God, I'm powerless. I need you to come into my life and to do something in my life. And so he began to read scripture. He said, not now because he had to, because when he was growing up, his family went to church and they had to read scripture. He said, now it's because I want to. I want to know what God's will is in my life. So when you read your Bible, it's not just something that you're, a book you're reading. It's something that God is telling you how and what he wants you to do in your life. And what Billy Graham was simply saying was, is you, might be, you might think you're the smallest person in the world. You might think you're of no value. But if God takes a hold of you and uses you, he can make you do something that is extra special. And when uh, we first, when Larissa came to me and Eric said, we want to start, we would like to start a praise and worship team. And I thought, well, I came out of, I'll tell you, I came out of a brethren assembly. We came into church, we sat on our hands, we didn't smile, we always opened our Bible when the guy went up to the front, and that was a must. And you didn't look around, and your kids had to sit on the chair for the whole hour and do nothing. So coming out of that and now coming into uh, praise and worship, I'm beginning now to feel the freedom. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm beginning now to get a little freedom. God gives us freedom to worship him. Not, not to sit like stumps. Not to sit and, and be nothing. But he wants us to worship him. And so I'm, gla I'm glad I'm slowly, and I'm not to John yet, but I'm getting there. Um, and if you feel free, let the Spirit move you. <laughs> you know what? The Spirit wants to move all of us. The Spirit's in, the, in this house. One of the things that really stuck out to me in the book of Philemon is, it is a story in a story. It's like a parable. It's an earthly story, but it has a heavenly meaning inside of it. I'm sure you all picked it up as you were going, as Miranda was reading it so lovely and saying all of those nice names. Last week we had four people profess to know the Lord as their Savior and decided to follow him in the waters of baptism. That's great. That profession encouraged me. I don't know about you, but every time someone gives a testimony or someone gives a profession, it encourages me that I want to worship God more. In this story, Onesimus, he's a runaway slave. Back in those days, that was not a good thing. But he runs away to Rome. You see God working in the pages of this story. He runs away to Rome, and who do you think is standing on the corner preaching the gospel? Paul. And he hears the gospel, and he gets saved. So he gets, he, he gets his sins taken away, just like Anthony Oliver did in the pickup truck. But there's still, he has to restore, be restored. So Paul says, you're going back. You're going back to where you ran away from. And I don't know if you stole money or not, but you're going back there and you're going to pay back everything you owe. Because that's what we do, right? In verse 2, I think it is, at the end of the verse, it says, a church in thy house. Is that the right verse? Yeah, verse 2. A church in thy house. You know what the church is? Anybody? The people, you and I are the church. This is a building. This is God's building. God wants us to use it. Whether it's to praise him, whether it's to have fellowship, whatever it is, he wants us to use it, this building, but to use it for his glory. For his glory. So we're not going to throw wild parties or anything like that. Now... I, I've been praying this week that there would be a, a revival in Ontario. I don't know if it'll happen. But I think if we all prayed, because Paul talks about prayer. What's the thing that he talks about when he talks about prayer? Giving thanks, praise, and intercession. So the first thing that we need to do when we pray is, is to give God thanks. Why? I'm a new man. <laughs> I don't know about you. If you've accepted the Lord as your Savior, you're new. 
You're not that same old one. Anthony Oliver said in his truck when he got saved, he said, now God, all that 31 years behind me is gone. From now on, it's all new. And he began to give his life to Christ. The verses that he holds on dearly to, and if you want to turn there, let's turn to Proverbs, just after the book of Psalms. Proverbs chapter 4. And he, he, he took his Bible out, apparently on this show that he was on, and he read it. And he said, these are the verses that I have built my life on. I don't know if it works for you. It works for him. But Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son. Now, he wasn't a son before, but once he accepted the Lord, he became God's son. So God says to him, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ears unto my saying. What's he saying? Read it! You know, don't throw this up on the shelf when you go home and say, Oh, there, that's good till next Sunday. No, pick it up. Read it. It's important. Last Wednesday night, we had, was it 10 or 11 people? 10? 10? We, we had a full table. I had to put another table out now, hoping that we get the same 10 and maybe more. God wants to use this book. He wants to use it in your life, and he wants to use it to those who are out there in the world. Then he says, Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in thy mouth midst of thine heart. Where does God tell us to put this book? Here, in our heart. <laughs> you can have all this knowledge you want, but if it's not here, it's no good. He wants us to put it in our hearts. For, thy, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What is God saying there? Where does sin come from? <laughs> from within, right? It festers up like cancer and it begins and it slowly takes over. Okay, back to, back to Philemon. We're going to... I'm wasting all my time here. So, Billy Graham was saying, um, God is tired of using people to get all the glory. He said... Whoever you are, and whatever you're doing, do it for the Lord, and that's all. But do it diligently. So he's saying, you don't have to be Billy Graham. You might be Gary or uh, John or someone, and you might be telling somebody at work about the Lord, and the Lord will bless it. I believe... That we are almost in the last day. I believe there's going to be a revival in Canada. And I'm praying every night that God will have a revival in this country. We have gotten so far away from God that it's, it's not even funny anymore. We allow everything and anything. We have become politically correct. That's our stand now. We as Christians need to stand up and say, no, we're not doing that no more. We're going to have a revival in this province and we're going to make sure that God's name is mentioned and carried out. One of the other things that Paul says in verse 17 is, he says, If thou count me therefore a partner or equal, receive him as myself. Here's Paul the apostle. You know, he's been beaten. He's been kicked out of cities. He's been cast in jail now. And he's saying, if you count me equal with you, now, I would never count my life equal with Paul's because his life is exemplary, whatever you want to call it. His life is one that I look up to. But Paul says, no, 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 no. We're all equal. We're all God's children. God loves us all equally. And God wants to use us all equally. That's what Billy Graham was trying to say. He wants to use you and I. He wants to to do something with our lives. Whatever it is. Whatever. It doesn't have to be something wonderful. And in verse 21, he says, I have this confidence that you will not only treat me equal, but when I send Onesimus, you will treat him better than I could even think. So Paul's assured because of the testimony of Philemon. It said back in the beginning, his testimony or his way of life was what? Love and faith. 
And later on it says faith and love. Faith has to come first. I'm sorry. If you weren't, if you didn't have faith and love Christ, you would sure not love me. I have a lot of rough edges. I would probably rub, rub everybody just so wrong. Just ask my wife. She's not in here. So, But because we have faith, because we love Christ, that love does what? It overflows into those who are around us. A church in thy house. God's house, this is the church. And how are we to deal with one another? In love. I... I had a, uh, we were at a brethren assembly and we, our kids got a little tired so they sat underneath the pew. And after the man was done speaking, he came down from the front and he came over to me and he said, where were your children during the, mes the message? I said, they were on the floor underneath the pew. And he gave me a blast. He said, they're never going to learn under there. And I thought to myself, well, if you want them to learn, why don't you put them in a place where they're learning at their level? That's why we have adult Sunday school and church and children's adult <laughs> church and Sunday school. So that they can learn at a level that they're at. But he was very dogmatic about the fact they weren't going to learn there. They needed to be up in the church. So it's a story in a story. And it shows us God's Greatness. Onesimus runs away. He runs to Rome. There's Paul. And Paul preaches and Onesimus gets saved. Isn't that wonderful? How God works. Isn't God great? Amen? Yeah. Onesimus thought, well, I'll run all the way to Rome and then nobody will find me and nobody will care and I'll be all right. Because you know what happened to a runaway slave? They could have a leg chopped off or they could have an arm chopped off. Whatever it was that the owner thought they needed to teach him a lesson. So he runs away to Rome and he's going to hide there. He's going to make sure nobody finds him. But who finds him? God found him. God found him on the corner of the street or in a, a courtyard or wherever. Wherever it was that Paul was preaching, God brought Onesimus and God found him. And inside his heart was placed God's word. So it's a, an example of love and faith. Because now Onesimus has to stand up and be restored. He has to go back and say to Philemon, I'm sorry. He has to go back to Philemon and hope that Philemon will deal with him with love and faith. How should we deal with each other here? And I, you might get tired of me saying this. How should we deal with each other here? And love. We, ha we are a family. This, this is God's house. And it's a church inside God's house. And in that house, when he was talking to Philemon here, he was talking about Philemon's house. And he was saying, you have a church in your house. It's become a family. But I'm sure Philemon didn't look at it like that. I'm sure he thought it was God's building. Because everything that you and I have comes from where? Anybody? God. Yes. He gives it to us to use. <laughs> Not to keep. To use. And to use for who? <laughs> for Him. This building should be a lighthouse, a testament to this area of Cortland. And that's what we're shooting for here. So what's, what's the other story inside the story? This is a personal letter that Paul writes to a Philemon. Maybe Paul didn't even realize that someday this letter, 25 verses, would be put in the Bible between Hebrews and Titus. Paul might not even have thought anything of it. He might have thought, oh well, I'll write this letter. And God took that letter and he put it in the book. Why is it in the book? Why is that letter in the book? For you and I. <laughs> so that we can learn. So that we can know what God wants. It tells us, too, how important a letter is. I'm no good at writing letters. Uh, you probably wouldn't read my line. I feel sorry for Judy when I give her the stuff and Blair on Wednesday. I hand the bulletin stuff to them and I don't know how they decode it. But anyways, they do a good job. But it tells us how powerful 
a little tiny letter can be. It's going to change Philemon's life. It's going to change Onesimus' life. And hopefully God is hoping it's going to change our life. Just with a little tiny letter. So, the story inside of a story. Verse 11. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and me. Paul says to Philemon, there was a time when Onesimus wasn't useful to you at all. If you stop and think, there was a time in your life when you weren't useful for God at all. At all. You say, oh, you can't say that. Oh, yes, I can. Because before we get saved, we are not doing what God wants. We are doing what we want. And we are looking for masters and for gods in other places. So there was a time when we were unprofitable to God. And we weren't doing anything that he wanted us to do. And verse 15. For perhaps he therefore parted for a season that thou should receive him forever. So when we were unprofitable to God, we were away from God. But God sent his son to die on a cross so that we could what? Be brought back. And not for a short period, but forever. Um, one of the things I thought about when I was reading through this was, if you've lost a loved one in the Lord, you're going to see them someday. Amen. Someday you're going to see that loved one in the Lord. No doubt. Because when we're brought back, we're brought back forever. Verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What is he saying there? He says, no longer as a servant. We serve God, but we're not servants. We're his what? Children. You're God's child. And God, like a father, wants only the good for you. But sometimes, like children, we do what? We wander away or we do something stupid. I can remember one time growing up, my one brother, there was a $5 bill laying on the counter, and my brother took the $5 bill, and he took us all to the store and bought us all candy and all kinds of good stuff. And when we all came home, my dad said, where's the $5 bill that was on the counter? We all looked at one another and didn't say nothing. We had pockets full of candy, and he said, where's the $5 bill? Finally, my brother said, well, I thought it was there for us. <laughs> He knew it wasn't there for us. But anyways, my dad said, so you took it without asking. And he said, yeah. But you know what? My dad didn't kick my brother out of the family because he'd done something stupid. My dad said, I still love you, but you're going to pay that $5 back. He made him restore the $5. God's the same way. He doesn't kick us out of the family because we do something stupid, which we all do. Verse 17, if thou count me therefore a brother, receive him as myself. The word brother there simply means equal. Paul says to Philemon, if you count me as equal to you, then receive Onesimus as you would myself. When Christ goes before God and he says to God, I want you to treat Bob just like he was me. How does God treat us? How does God treat us? Yeah, in love. Because we're in Christ, he looks at us through who? Through Christ. <laughs> I'm no longer that stupid nut sinner that used to live, but now I'm in Christ and God looks at me through him. Then verse 19, it's, verse 18 says, and I love this verse, If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee anything, put that on my account. When, God, when Jesus goes before God and he says, Jim just got saved. And if he owes you anything, what's the wages of sin? Death. He says if he owes you anything, not just a little, anything, put it on whose account? On his account. On Christ's account. So everything I did, Christ put it on his account. When he went to the cross, he took all my sins and put them there. So that I no longer had to pay the debt. The debt was paid. Verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, howbeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self, beside. The man that led me to the Lord has always had a soft spot in my heart. 
If he needed something, I would be there in a minute to try and help him. If he needed somebody to stand up for him, I would be willing to stand up for him, whatever it is. Because I owe him a lot. <laughs> he introduced me to Christ. You might say, oh, well, you don't owe him anything. Oh, yes, I do. He's the one that told me how much Christ loved me and how much I didn't have to go to hell. And I'm sorry if I say that word and offend you, but there's a hell and there's a heaven. But I could go to heaven. And I took that and I made that my life because of what he told me that night. Paul says, I have written it with my own hand. Why? You know, most of Paul's letters he didn't write. I don't know how many epistles that Paul wrote, but he didn't write most of them. He wrote odd little pieces. But what he's saying to Philemon here is, is I wrote this with my own hand. And most scholars believe that Paul was going blind at the time when he was in prison. So he would have had great big letters and scratch out letters and it wouldn't have looked that pretty. It would have looked like what I give to Judy and Blair. And he said, I wrote this with my own hand because why? So that you have a promise that I will repay everything that Philemon owns. Christ wrote your salvation on the cross with his what? Blood. With his blood. He scribbled it out on the cross. I will pay it all back. Verse 22. Uh, but with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Paul says to Philemon, someday I'm going to come and I'm going to visit you and I want to have a room all ready for me. So get it ready. Because you can bet for sure I'm going to, because of your prayers, I'm going to get out of prison and I'm going to go and visit you. Who's preparing a room for us? Anybody? That's right. John 14 and 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself. He's preparing a place for each one of us that know the Lord is our Savior. So what is that, the key thing here? What is the main thing about this story? Love and faith. Faith that Christ died on the cross to take away your sins. And then that love that you have for him because of what he has done should do what? It should be an outpouring. So when I stand up and I do this and I do this, you should look at me in love and say, well, he's okay. He, you know, he'll be fine. And what it should do, if you watch Gary and John, it should make you desire to do, to be free. Christ has freed us. He wants us to be free. Now, I'm not saying you're going to get up and dance or anything, but he wants us to be free. He wants us to worship him in freedom. So that's what we need to do. So the story inside the story. But I go back to Oliver Anthony, and he said, before he got saved, he could not speak in front of five people. And then when he got saved, he went to the fair, and he spoke in front of 500 and he said he was scared to death and as his song began to get more and more played he began to get bigger and he said he walked into a, a, I, I can't remember the place in Nashville it was an outside venue and he said there was over 10,000 people crowded in to this little area he said that when I first looked he said I was scared to death but what he does every time he has a concert is he reads at least six verses from this book. He won't sing. And if you don't want to listen to the six verses, then get out. He won't sing or do anything until he has read those six verses. They might be from Matthew. He said he likes Matthew, Luke, Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastes. He said he really starting to like it. So what has God given us this letter for? That's what it is, isn't it? It's a letter to you and I from God. What's he given it to us for? To throw on the shelf? To put under the seat? No. He gives it to us so that we can read the letter that he's trying to tell us what he wants us to do. And remember what Billy Graham said? Don't try and be somebody special. Just be that little person you are wherever you are. And God will use that. John? John?